The Battle of Spie and Kop was fought about 38 kilometers west southwest of Ladysmith on the hilltop of Spie Kop along the Tugela River, Natal in South Africa from 23 January 24, 1900. It was fought between the South African Republic and the Orange Free State on the one hand and British forces during the Second Boer War during the campaign to relieve Ladysmith and resulted in a British defeat. Planning and crossing the Tugela. General Sir Redvers Buller, VC, commander of the British forces in Natal, was attempting to relieve a British force besieged in Ladysmith. The Boers under General Louis Boda held the Tugela River against him. Although Boda's men were outnumbered, they were mostly equipped with modern Mauser rifles and up-to-date field guns, and had carefully entrenched their positions. In late December, 1899, Buller made a frontal assault on the Boer positions at the Battle of Colenso. The result was a heavy British defeat. Over the next few weeks, Buller received further reinforcements, and also acquired sufficient carts and transport to operate away from the railway line which was his main supply line. Buller devised a new plan of attack to relieve Ladysmith. His army was to launch a two-pronged offensive designed to cross the Tugela River at two points and create a bridgehead. They would then attack the defensive line that blocked Buller's advance to Ladysmith. The area was only 20 miles from Ladysmith. Buller delegated control of his main force to General Sir Charles Warren, to cross at Treehearts Drift. Buller would then send a second smaller force, under Major General Neville Littleton to attack east of Warren's force as a diversion at Potgeter's Drift. Once across the Tugela the British would attack the Boer defensive positions and then cross the open plains to relieve Ladysmith. Warren's force numbered 11,000 infantry, 2,200 cavalry, and 36 field guns. On the 11th they marched westward to cross the Little Tugela and take up position in front of Potgeter's Ferry. However their march was easily visible to the Boers, and so slow that by the time they arrived at the Tugela, the Boers had entrenched a new position covering it. On the 18th British mounted troops under the Earl of Dundonald enterprisingly reached the extreme Boer right flank, from where there was little to stop them riding to Lady Smith, but Warren recalled them to guard the force's baggage. Once all his force had crossed the river, Warren sent part of an infantry division under Lt. Gen. Francis Cleary against the Boer right flank positions on a plateau named Tabanyama. The Boers had once again entrenched a new position on the reverse slopes of the plateau, and Cleary's attack made no progress. Meanwhile the secondary British attack by Littleton at Potgeter's Drift had yet to commence in full. The Cop. Spee and Cop, just northeast of Warren's force, was the largest hill in the region, being over 1,400 feet in height. It lay almost exactly at the center of the Boer line. If the British could capture this position and bring artillery to the hill then they would command the flanks of the surrounding Boer positions. On the night of 23rd of January, Warren sent the larger part of his force under Major General Edward Woodgate to secure Spee and Kopp. Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Thornycroft was selected to lead the initial assault. The British climbed up the hill at night and in dense mist. They surprised the small Boer piquet and drove them off the Kopp at Bayonet Point. Of the 15 men in the Boer Piquet, one was mortally wounded and his grave lies on the hill to this day. Ten British soldiers were wounded in the charge. The surviving Boers retreated down the hill to their camp waking up their fellow Boers by screaming die angle sis op die cop. A half company of British sappers began to entrench the position with a mere 20 picks and 20 shovels and Major General Woodgate notified General Warren of the successful capture of the hilltop. As dawn broke, the British discovered that they held only the smaller and lower part of the hilltop of Spee and Kopp, while the Boers occupied higher ground on three sides of the British position. The British had no direct knowledge of the topography of the summit and the darkness and fog had compounded the problem. To make matters worse, the British trenches were inadequate for all defensive purposes. Because the summit of the Kopp was mostly hard rock, the trenches were at most 40 centimeters deep and provided an exceptionally poor defensive position, the British infantry in the trenches could not see over the crest of the plateau and the Boers were able to fire down the length of the crescent-shaped trench from the adjacent peaks. The Boer generals were not unduly concerned by the news that the British had taken the cop. They knew that their artillery on Tabanyama could be brought to bear on the British position and that rifle fire could be brought to bear from parts of the cop not yet occupied by the British. However, the Boer generals also knew that sniping and artillery alone would not be sufficient to dislodge the British, and the Boer position was desperately vulnerable. 
If the British immediately established positions on Conical Hill and Ala Knoll they could bring their artillery to bear on Tabanyama, threatening the key Boer positions there. More importantly, there was a risk that the British would storm Twin Peaks to the eastern end of Spion Kop. If Twin Peaks fell, the British would be able to turn the Boer's left flank and annihilate the main Boer encampment. The Boer generals realized that Spion Kop would have to be stormed quickly if disaster were to be averted. The Boers began to bombard the British position, dropping shells from the adjacent plateau of Tabanyama at a rate of 10 rounds per minute. Meanwhile, Commandant Hendrik Prinsloo of the Carolina Commando captured Allo Knoll and Conical Hill with some 88 men, while around 300 burghers, mainly of the Pretoria Commando, climbed the cop to launch a frontal assault on the British position. Prinsloo told his men, Burgers, we're now going in to attack the enemy and we shan't all be coming back. Do your duty and trust in the Lord. Minutes later, hundreds of Boers swarmed in to attack the British positions at the Spee and Cop Crestline, much to the surprise of the British because it was very unusual for the Boers to launch a daytime massed attack that quickly resulted in vicious, close quarters combat which was not custom to the Boers' style of warfare. The British Lee Meatford and Lee Enfield rifles were no less deadly than the Boer Mauser rifles however as both sides exchanged fire at close range, as well as engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat with the British wielding fixed bayonets and the Boers wielding hunting knives and their own rifles which they used as bludgeons. After suffering serious losses, the Boer assault carried the crest line after several minutes of brutal hand-to-hand -hand combat, but could advance no further. A kind of stalemate now settled over the cop. The Boers had failed to drive the British off the cop, but the surviving men of the Pretoria and Carolina Commando now held a firing line on Allo Knoll from where they could enfilade the British position and the British were now under sustained bombardment from the Boer artillery. The British had failed to exploit their initial success, and the initiative now passed to the Boers. Morale began to sag on both sides as the extreme heat, exhaustion and thirst took hold. On one hand the Boers on the cop could see large numbers of burghers on the plains below them who refused to join the fight. The sense of betrayal, the bloody failure of the frontal assault, the indiscipline inherent in a civilian army and the apparent security of the British position proved too much for some Boers, who began to abandon their hard-won positions. On the other hand the bombardment began to take its toll on the British. Major General Woodgate fell about 8.30, mortally wounded by a shell splinter. In quick succession, Colonel Blomfield of the Lancashire Fusiliers took command but was wounded soon after Woodgate's death, while the Sappers officer, Major H. H. Massey, and Woodgate's brigade major, Captain N. H. Vertu, were killed. Officers and men from different units were intermingled, and the British were now leaderless, confused and pinned down by the heavy Boer artillery and rifle fire. The British artillery, positioned lower down the slopes of Spion Kop, were unable to hit back at the Boer guns. Colonel Mulby Crofton of the Royal Lancasters took charge and semaphored a plea for help, reinforce at once or all is lost. General dead. After that the stunned colonel failed to exercise any leadership. Thornycroft seems to have taken charge, leading a spirited counterattack that failed in the face of withering fire. Warren had already dispatched Major General John Talbot Coke's brigade of two regular battalions and the Imperial Light Infantry to reinforce the summit. However, he refused to launch an attack on Tabanyama and barred his guns from firing on Alan Knoll, believing this to be part of the British position. At 11.40, Buller, who could see that things were not going well, suggested to Warren that Thornycroft be appointed commander on the cop. The first runner to Thornycroft was shot dead before he could utter a word. Finally, a second runner brought the news, you are a general. Winston Churchill was a journalist stationed in South Africa and he had also been commissioned as a lieutenant in the South African Light Horse by General Buller after his well-publicized escape from Boer captivity. Churchill acted as a courier to and from Spion Cop and General Buller's HQ and made a statement about the scene, corpses lay here and there. Many of the wounds were of a horrible nature. The splinters and fragments of the shells had torn and mutilated them. The shallow trenches were choked with dead and wounded. About 1300 hours, the situation proved too much for some men of the Lancashire Fusiliers who attempted to surrender. Thornycroft personally intervened and shouted at the Boers who advanced to round up prisoners, I'm the commandant here, take your men back to hell sir. I allow no surrenders. Luckily for Thornycroft, the first of the British reinforcements arrived at this moment. 
a vicious point-blank firefight ensued but the British line had been saved. At 1430, Thornycroft sent Warren a plea for reinforcements and water. Meanwhile, Coke never reached the summit. He saw Thornycroft's message for help but then did nothing to assure the lieutenant colonel of his nearby presence or support. The Middlesex Regiment and the Imperial Light Infantry, under Colonel Hill, who was senior to Thornycroft in the army list and who also believed he was overall commander on the COP, held the British right for two and a half hours until a second crisis occurred when they too began to give way. The Cameronians arrived at this point, and drove the Boers back with a bayonet charge. The fighting on the British right now became a stalemate. In the morning, Warren had asked for reinforcements from Littleton's division, even though he had 11 battalions of his own to draw upon. Without asking Buller, Littleton sent two battalions towards Spian Cop. One battalion, the King's Royal Rifle Corps turned aside to attack Twin Peaks. After losing Lt. Col. Riddell killed and 100 other casualties, the rifles cracked the thin bore line and carried the double summit at 1700 hours. The Aftermath Shattered by the loss of Twin Peaks, General Schock Willem Berger took his commando out of the battle line that night. On Spian Cop, the Boers who had fought bravely since morning abandoned their positions as darkness fell. They were about to retreat, when Boda appeared and persuaded them to stay. However, the Boers did not reclaim their positions. Unknown to Thornycroft, the battle was as good as won. But Thornycroft's nerve was also shattered. After 16 hours on the cop doing the job of a brigadier general in total absence of instructions from Warren, he ordered an unauthorized withdrawal from Spian Cop after reporting that the soldiers had no water and ammunition was running short. His reasons for withdrawing were that without artillery support to counter the heavy Boer artillery fire, there was no possibility of defending the position and the extreme difficulty of digging trenches on the summit of Spian Cop left the British soldiers completely exposed. Churchill appeared on the scene for the second time. This time he brought the first orders from Warren since he elevated Thornycroft to brigadier. Churchill said 1,400 men were on the way with two large naval guns. Thornycroft told him, better six good battalions safely down the hill than a bloody mop up in the morning. He ordered the brigade to retreat. At the same time, Buller sent Littleton strict orders to recall his troops from Twin Peaks. When morning came, the Boer generals were astonished to see two burghers on the top of Spian Cop, waving their slouch hats in triumph. The only British on the cop were the dead and the dying. The British suffered 243 fatalities during the battle, many were buried in the trenches where they fell. Approximately 1,250 British were either wounded or captured. Mohandas Gandhi was a stretcher-bearer at the battle, in the Indian Ambulance Corps he had organized, and was decorated. The Boers suffered 335 casualties of which 68 were dead. Commandant Prince Lu's commando lost 55 killed and wounded out of 88 men. The British retreated back over the Tugela but the Boers were too weak to follow up their success. Buller managed to rally his troops, Ladysmith would be relieved by the British four weeks later. Commentary Buller erred in appointing Warren an independent commander, despite his own doubts about his subordinate's capacity. On the evening of the battle, Warren only ordered up reinforcements in men and heavy guns at the late hour of 9 p.m. Medical assistance, water and ammunition were also tardy in arriving. Still, perhaps it was not Warren's failure to remedy these deficiencies that proved his worst error. It was his failure to tell Thornycroft of his plans to do so. Astonishing as it may seem, he had sent no direct instructions to Thornycroft since the heliogram appointing him a general at midday. He had left it to Coke to reassure Thornycroft, although Warren had never actually told Coke that he had put Thornycroft in charge. Then, to compound all these blunders, at 9 p.m. Warren had ordered Coke to return to the HQ for consultation, leaving Thornycroft alone among the horrors on the summit.